This episode is brought to you by My Life Among Humans, a new graphic novel written and illustrated by longtime Geek's Guide to the Galaxy listener Jed McGowan. Jed's work has been nominated for an Ignatz Award, been featured in the Best American Comics 2019, and appeared in outlets such as the New York Times, Vice, and Wired. And here's a description of My Life Among Humans. It says, My Life Among Humans is an evocative, melancholy, and ultimately hopeful graphic novel about a solitary alien's misguided search for connection among its human subjects. A nameless alien data compiler comes to Earth to study humans, setting up shop on the outskirts of a small desert community in North America. Working under forced labor, it must watch humans in complete secrecy while sending regular reports to its manager back home. Using spore-like technology to read the minds of its hosts, the alien quickly takes a special interest in Will, one of its early subjects. That interest proves to be a problem when the alien is accidentally revealed to Will's family, and it takes desperate measures to save its own life. In doing so, it discovers a forbidden ability. It can control human minds. Now, the alien struggles to keep this secret from its manager, deal with a growing number of suspicious humans, and come to terms with its ethically questionable decisions. My Life Among Humans is a beautifully painted, evocative first graphic novel from illustrator and cartoonist Jed McGowan. Library Journal writes that My Life Among Humans is, quote, recommended for all who have felt like an outsider looking in, and Eisner Award-winning artist Ryan North, who was our guest back in episode 93, writes, My Life Among Humans is a sweet, empowering story about our capacity for connection, both human and alien. So again, the book is called My Life Among Humans by Jed McGowan, and it's out now from Oni Press. And you can learn more over at jedmcgowan.com. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 537 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm David Barr Kirtley, author of the book Save Me Please and Other Stories, which is available now on Amazon.com. We had a great conversation about the book back in episode 500, so definitely check that out if you missed it. And today on the show, we'll be discussing Frank Herbert's classic novel Dune Messiah, the second book in the Dune series. We previously discussed the first Dune book back in episode 417, so definitely check that out if you missed it. And this will include spoilers for everything in Dune Messiah, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Andrea Kale, making her 28th appearance on the show. She's a graduate of the Odyssey Writers Workshop, and her short fiction appears in the Writers of the Future anthology, Fantasy Magazine, and Lightspeed. She's been a television writer, producer, and script supervisor for shows such as Late Night with Conan O'Brien, The Chew, and WWE's Monday Night Raw and Friday Night Smackdown, and she's currently a writer for Pixelberry Studios. So, Andrea, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dave. The next up, we've got Matthew Kressel, also making his 28th appearance on the show. His novel Queen of Static, the follow-up to his groundbreaking novel King of Shards, is available now. And he recently launched a newsletter of writing advice at outerdeep.substack.com. Together with Ellen Datlow, he hosts the monthly Fantastic Fiction Reading Series in New York City. So, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. Good to be here. And also joining us today is Raj Ankana, making his 22nd appearance on the show. He's the author of the post-apocalyptic novels Falling Sky, Rising Tide, and Raining Fire. And his short fiction appears in magazines such as Analog, Lightspeed, and Beneath Ceaseless Skies. His articles have appeared on Tor.com and LitReactor.com. So, Raj, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Happy to be back in the Dune universe. (laughs) Okay, so let's start off with Andrea and have you tell us about your history reading Dune Messiah. Well, uh, as I uh, frequently say and as we talked about when um, uh, when we did the Dune, the the panel on Dune, uh, Dune is one of the books that was made me want to be a writer. It's one of the three foundational books books of my childhood that that formed who I was. Um, and so I read it when I was like maybe about 13 or 14 and just gobbled it up. And of course, the first thing you do when you finish a book that you love is you go run for the sequel. And I so I ran for the sequel and I read Dune Messiah and it was uh, not the same. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it was a very different experience. Um, it was... It, 
and I must, I want to say that I was 14 at the time. Um, so it was very perplexing. It was depressing. It was, I, I just didn't know what was going on. And I read them all. Like I, I went on to read the next two that were available at the time, but it kind of just, it, it put me off the whole thing, <laughs> so to speak. So, um, you know, coming back to it now, I was hoping for a different experience, uh, reading it again as an adult, um, and, and I didn't actually get that. <laughs> sort of the same experience. <laughs> hmm. All right. Well, let's not get too far okay. ahead. But so, so when you say it puts you off the whole thing, you you mean it puts you off the Dune sequels, not yeah. off the original? Book, oh, not right? off the original book. No, nothing. The book. I reread the original Dune uh, at least once a year till I was probably about twenty. Um, that's how much it affects me. It affected me then. It still affects me. I read it again when we did it what two years ago, and it still had the same effect on me. The, the, but it, it put me off the rest of the story. I didn't want to know anymore, I think is how I should put it. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Well, so how about Matt? What's your history with Dune Messiah? Yeah. So um, I think I, I read it. Um, well, I, I re- first read the Dune about 20 years ago uh, in kind of a, and I mentioned this before, in kind of like a fugue state, right? I think I read it in like a day, a mm-hmm. day and a half, the first one. And and I think I powered through this and and um, uh, Children of Dune, like the next couple of books and, you know, maybe not as necessarily as fast, but within a really short period of time. So I was kind of surprised when I reread it now, because this is the first time in 20 years that I've reread it like how little I actually remembered of it. I remembered like certain specific things that we get into with like hate and um, some of the, the, what happens to Paul and Chani, but I was really surprised at, at how little I remembered. And and I have a theory as to why that is, but uh, <laughs> as, as we, as we go more into the podcast, I can get into that. Um, but uh, well, yeah. Did you remember liking it or how did you remember like anything like that? Um, well, that's just it. Like when I think back to my memory, I was like, "Oh, and this happens in book two. and and I was like, "Oh no, that that was actually book three. My memory of this book was like completely wrong. Huh. Um, yeah, like basically, I'll get into it, but i I feel almost like as if this book, I mean, it is. it's it's like act two of a of like yeah. a three or four act play. So it <laughs> doesn't quite resolve for me in the in the way I felt that maybe book one does. But um, we'll get into it. (laughs) Okay. So how about Raj? What's your history with Dune Messiah? So I think I figured out that I read this for the first time about 12 or 13 years ago because I remember where I was living at the time when I was reading it. And it wasn't too long after I read Dune. And I mean, I agree with Andrea and probably most of the people who have read these, these books that it doesn't live up to the first novel, but I also think it's it's really hard for anything to live up to that novel mm-hmm. because it is one of my favorite novels of all time. And I think it stands alone so well. Like if you never read past it, I think it works yeah. really well. Um, and and there, I think it's that that lightning. It's it, it's hard to recapture, especially when you stretch the story out. So. I think it could never possibly live up to the first one, which I understand leads to a lot of disappointment. I will say that this is, as, as a complete book, as far as I have ever read in the Dune series, I started the next one, Children of Dune, and like abandoned it within the first, I don't know, four or five chapters. So this is sort of like revisiting the journey you know, before I walked off the path. Um, but I will say that I, you know, from, from before... There was a lot of stuff I remember liking, like elements that I I thought still kind of worked. And there was one image that I won't get into until we we get around to that, but one really strong image, character image that stuck with me all the years since. And that was sort of what I was thinking about when I went back into this. I think what I found the most surprising is that characters on the first read that I was like, ugh, I don't really care for that character, but I care for this character, like some elements of that completely flipped on this reading um, where I was really engaged by some of the characters sort of storylines and others. I was like, Oh, this is going on for too long in a, in a weird way. So um, I, I generally think, you know, again, it's not as successful, but I do think that there's a lot of cool stuff in there. And like I said, like, I feel like if you can 
kind of give me an image that sticks with me for more than a decade, I feel like there's something working in, in this book. So, Yeah. Um, okay. So let me just say what the sort of history of this book is, as I remember. So basically, you know, so Frank Herbert had published the original Dune stories. It was serialized in by John W. Campbell in Astounding Magazine and been a big hit. And so... Frank Herbert wrote this, and I, I was just reading that he had actually written sections of this and Children of Dune, even before he finished writing the original Dune. So they were all kind of conceived as one big story. Um, and he had been a speech writer, um, you know, for a congressman or something. And so and had sort of seen how the sausage is made when it comes <laughs> to politics and developed a very cynical view of politics. And so he had kind of this grand idea that he wanted to start off the story and have Paul Atreides be this um, this hero, this with you know this sort of special destiny and superpowers that everybody would love, and then show you how he had flaws and maybe it wasn't the best ruler and you know not everything worked out for him and, and stuff like that. And so that was all part of the concept from the beginning. Um, but so so he when he sent this to John W. Campbell, Campbell rejected it and said, you know, Campbell, uh, by this point, I think had sort of gotten into Dianetics, the <laughs> L. Ron Hubbard thing that was sort of a forerunner of Scientology and was sort of really um, preoccupied with the idea of, you know, super the Superman and developing psychic powers and I don't know, kind of stuff like that. Um, but so he told Herbert, you know, people don't want this. People want to read the stories about heroes doing awesome stuff. So he rejected it. And so Herbert sent it to, um, uh, I think it was Horace Gold at Galaxy Magazine. It was Galaxy Magazine anyway, yeah. um, who published it. Um, and so, yeah, so right from the beginning, you know, people have had mixed feelings about the direction that Herbert, you know, this is something like he obviously cared about a lot, but has not necessarily resonated with all readers and, um, in the introduction to this book, Brian Herbert, and he's Frank Herbert's son, he's along with Kevin J. Anderson continued the Dune series. But in his introduction, he says that National Lampoon called Dune Messiah like the disappointment of the year or something like mm -hmm. that. So, uh, so yeah, so if you had mixed feelings about this book, uh, you know, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Um Andrea, I, I sort of hear you yeah. respond. Do you want to well, uh, pick up on any of that? I had uh, so I have the original, all my original books from like you know the sixties. Actually, I think they might all be original um, pr prints, um, and that's what I read when I was fourteen. But for this, I uh, I got I got a digital version from the library just because it was just easier for me to read, and um, I, that's when I read the introduction. Obviously, the 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 Brian Herbert introduction was not in the original. Um, and that's when I found out about the reception and um, and how he talks in that intro about you know how his father was a speechwriter in politics and you know the cult of personality and what happens after to heroes and messiahs after the you know all the cameras go away so to speak and uh, it, it and it resonated it it's 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 the the concept is great like as an as a, a thinking person i find the concept really interesting um and one of the examples he brings up is john kennedy um you know yeah. the whole camelot thing that the mystique around him and you know if he had he was a flawed man though there was a great deal of many flaws in him and what would have happened had he not been assassinated what how would he have fallen uh, that's that was my sorry. That's my addition to that. He didn't say that, um, but it, it's intellectually I get it, and intellectually it's an interesting concept. But in reality, once you've come to love a character, it's hard to go. Oh, okay, I'll I will take this intellectual journey with you to see how you know bad things happen to people who mean well. Um, you know, I, I truly loved Paul, uh, the character and to see what he becomes, it's incredibly painful and to see what he allows to happen is also incredibly painful, which is the point, but also I'm a human and I don't want to see this. It's, it's, it, it, I'm so two minded on it 
It, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's it's very it, it's very hard. It's, well, you know, you know. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry, no. I was going to say we. I think we touched upon this when we were talking about the first novel, in that you know he intended that message to be in that first book, but I think. And I, for me, I think it must be sort of age because I think a lot of people, when you read it at a young age, you're used to that sort of hero's journey, and yeah. and it, it's easily, I think, misinterpreted where you can take it as you know this triumph of this of this guy, and so I think his subtle message gets lost a lot of the time. And that's why I was thinking like, obviously he went in for this second novel and was like, I'm definitely like nailing this message out there because that was yeah. my intent all along. But I get how people get disappointed. I think me reading Dune again for this for the previous podcast, that message was more clear to me and that, you know, mm-hmm. once it once it had come out. And so this felt like it, it, it almost felt like overkill where he was just like, let me make sure that no one has any doubts of what I'm talking about. Um, but I did, I, I will say, I did like the fact that he kind of sets it up that, you know, even Paul is flawed. Like Paul has no agency almost in this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Like he's, and, and that's yeah. hinted at in the last book and he gets sort of trapped in this thing. So, um, but yeah, I, I completely get it because I think most people read that first book and think, oh, Paul's the hero and and he's meant to be the hero. And, and then this one comes along and you're like, oh shit. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, let me let me just set up what what I, what's happened. So we're we're twelve years since the first book, and at the end of the first book, Paul had become like emperor of the universe, basically, and was had controlled the spice melange that is the most important resource in the galaxy, and um, yeah, and was basically the most powerful person in existence. He can see the future. He has all sorts of um, you know. He's the Kwisatz Haderach who can you know be in many places at once and. He has like all. He's he's a little bit like overpowered, to be honest with you. But he's he's got all these powers, and so it seems like the the universe is his oyster at this point. And so in this book, we've jumped ahead twelve years, and he's still the emperor, but everything kind of sucks. His followers have gone, even though he didn't really want them to. His followers have gone on this jihad across the universe that's killed sixty what sixty one billion yeah. people. <laughs> yep. Um and uh. And he's sort of come to realize how trapped he is by his prophetic uh, visions that there's, you know, there's, there, he really has no choice about what's going to happen in the future. There's like all these horrible things and he just has to pick the least horrible path. And um, uh, yeah, and that's that's basically where, where the book picks up. Yeah. Um, so, so Matt, what did you, how did you kind of feel going into this? So uh, the, the opening chapters. Well, I think, you know, I sort of like Andrea, I found myself disappointed as I, as I reread it. And I, and I think for at least the the first two thirds of it, it like as a, as a writer looking at it with a, with a critiquing eye, it it doesn't actually work. And Mm -hmm. it's only until you get to like the last third where it starts to pick up and Mm -hmm. things get interesting. And I did a a lot of thinking as to why. And Mm -hmm. and it's just, as you said, uh, Dave, is that so much of his agency is gone. He, Mm -hmm. He sees that he has no choice. He can only do this one horrible thing because it's the least horrible thing. And, um, you know, Paul uh, sees that you know the 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 death of his beloved, but he he can't do anything about it. So, like, one of the problems that I had with it is that he just keeps saying over and over, "I see these visions, I see these horrible things, these horrible things." We don't really see the visions specifically, mm-hmm. and we don't really see any him make mm-hmm. any real effort to 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 find you know, the, the, the so-called path of least resistance, I guess. I mean, it only as the the plot goes on. Now there's some really cool things going on here. I, I love how Herbert flips the villain on its head. So like in the first book, you know, the Bene Gesserit are villains, you know, they, they, uh, um, you know, you have the Tlylaxu, um, who are sort of suspicious, but like, as it goes on in the story, you're like, oh no, they're trying to stop this this crazy murdering emperor, <laughs> you know, and and it's, so it's like the space and guild too. They're like, we can't let this go on, um, and maybe they don't see the the other futures that Paul sees. Uh, so I thought that was an interesting, uh, really interesting thing that Herbert did there. 
I also really thought um, that, you know, the whole, um, you know, he did in the first book, he talks about the plans within plans. So the, the Tlailaxu, they create this gola, which I, I assume is like a play on golem mm-hmm. of, uh, of his dead friend, Duncan Idaho, and uh, who's originally called Hate, um, H-A-Y-T. Um, I, I assume that's how it's pronounced. Um, and, you know, you think the plan or, or the, he sets you up to think the plan is that hate is there to, um, you know, murder Paul when Paul's at his weakest. But actually the plan mm-hmm. was to see if hate could overcome his programming and become the human he was before, because this is what they're then going to offer him when his beloved Chani dies that we can recreate her not as a you know simulacrum of her but actually the real her we can bring her back to life because the spacing guild sees this as well um that i was like oh that that was really intense and that was a great um setup mm-hmm. which uh i had forgot that was was coming when i when i reread it um but i i felt like that there was a whole lot of bureaucracy in the mm-hmm. first few pages like all this just <laughs> you know, oh, what, you know, people going over lists and like these boardroom meetings, it, it, it was not interesting Mm -hmm. to me. I mean, I I love the Dune world, but I I was thinking about this. We hardly ever go into the desert. I mean, we're on Mm -hmm. Dune, but we hardly ever go into desert. We don't see, I don't think we see a single worm in this. I mean, Mm -hmm. no, we, we we don't leave the palace. We don't leave the palace. Right. So, you know, they, they're talk of this where they stole a worm from Arrakis to mm-hmm. potentially start the spice cycle on another planet. That is such a cool idea. Why didn't we see that? Why didn't we mm-hmm. see someone swoop down? Um, you know, I, I I love the idea. Like, I thought there was some great scenes where Paul is disguised as a Fremen and goes and sees Alia doing like the ritual on the rights. And he's okay. Like, okay, we're getting we're getting a little ahead. Okay, <laughs> like, let's, I could I could st- get ahead all the time. But yeah. so, go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, let me let me just. Ex- I don't know if we set this up clearly. That Paul, we find out. I mean, it's it's sort of hinted at at the beginning. It's not made it completely explicit, but that he's seen a vision of Chani di- dying in childbirth. So he knows that, you know, as soon as she has, as soon as she gives birth, she's going to die. So he's sort of okay. It, it's it, it's very this the sum summarizing this all the this 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 is the most preposterously convoluted conspiracy yeah. of all time. <laughs> uh, so wait, I made a little list. These are the factions that are plotting against Paul. You have the displaced House Carino, mm-hmm. um, that's Princess Irulan, the Bene Gesserit, uh, represented by the Reverend's mother, Gaius Helen Mahayim, the Space and Guild, represented by Guild Navigator Edric, uh, there's a faction of the Fedakin, which are, is like the emperor's personal bodyguard. There's a faction of the Kitsarit, which is represented by Corbo, which is like Paul's Fremen. You know, it's like a faction Priest, of the Fremen. Priesthood, yeah. Yeah, it's the priest. Um, and then the Beni Tleilax, uh, represented by the dwarf Bajaz, which is like, they're like, I don't know, they do some sort of genetic engineering kind of stuff. And they all have... And Skytail, right? Who's the oh, face yeah, dancer. Yeah, repre- face dancer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, represent yeah represented by the sort of shapeshifter uh skytail and they all have like independent um agendas mm-hmm. and some of like skytail is planning to betray the rest of them and uh and like each of these this whole scheme has like five different <laughs> contingent uh you know parts to it and uh it's really really hard to at least i found it very very hard to understand let alone explain uh, especially since most of the key information you don't find out until like yeah. 90, 90% of the way yeah. through the book. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think that that was the big problem I saw as a, as a writer slash mm-hmm. you know, editor was that some of the stuff that was really emotionally powerful, like mm-hmm. Paul's vision of Chani dying and mm-hmm. him seeing no way out, was not made clear until nope. really late in the book. Apparently it was in there somewhere. I must have missed it when mm-hmm. I went through. Yeah, uh, it's not. In well, there. it doesn't. It doesn't mention Chani specifically. I mean, like, it's it is pretty clear if you know what you're looking for. He says something like, you know, was w- is one person is the sacrifice of one person worth the universe, even the most beloved person? It's like yeah. stuff like that. So okay, yeah. But 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 the idea, but but specifically that it's Chani, and specifically that she's going to die in childbirth. 
does not become clear until no. the later stages of the book, I don't think. No. But I, I agree with what you said, uh, uh, Matt, 100% is coming at it not just as a reader, as in a lover of, of Dune, um, but as a writer. And the whole time I'm reading this, I'm going, nothing's actually happening. Yeah. <laughs> like nothing, almost nothing happens yeah. up until the end. And it's just a bunch of scenes where Paul's, you know, like having, you know, thoughts and thoughts and thoughts. He's, e he's It's he's emo being, Paul. It's emo Paul. <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. being very philosophical. It's all these philosophical thought uh, monologues he's having in his head. It's like a freaking Shakespeare play. Um, but he doesn't actually do anything, and the pr and that's because he there is nothing he can do. He's given up. Like he's depressed, Paul. He's emo, Paul. He's given up trying, and so he's just going through the motions to the end that he has already foreseen, and the 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 the, the horrible end that he's chosen because it's the least horrible of all the ends. Um, so while that's an interesting for a character, it doesn't really make a very good book, you know. And every single scene that is important or emotional or exciting happens off screen. The worm thing, Chani's yeah. death. Um, the only thing we're there for is when he loses his sight, but it's so unemotional. The whole scene is so completely lacking emotion um, on Paul's side, on everything. It's just like, oh, and now I can't see. Wait, what? <laughs> like something really horrific has just happened. And I feel no emotional attachment to it. Just all I feel is Paul's detached depression about the whole thing, which again does not make for a good reading experience. Yeah. Um, you know, and even Paul's death, or well, I'm sorry, not Paul's death, but his going off into the desert happens off screen. We hear about it from Duncan. <laughs> right. And then How the killing of uh of, of Corba. I'm sorry, of not all Corba. of them. Of all of them, everybody uh, does. Uh, yeah, uh, Reverend Mother Mohan. Yes, like, everything happens off screen. Oh yeah, everything. They, they were, they were, Every yeah. single thing happens off screen, and yeah. it's just like uh... which is which is kind of crazy when you think about it because Herbert does this point of view switching, like yes, you know, in the middle of the page, which yes. almost no writer does today, or at least in speculative no. fiction that I read, I hardly ever see that like point of view switching. No, nobody and, does and, that. And you know what? What I mean by that. Uh, if those are, you know, if you're not clear, if people aren't clear about it is like, you know, you're, you're in someone's head and then you're immediately in someone else's head on the same page, which yep. most writers, authors, they'll put either a scene break or, a, you know, yeah. a chapter break to, to switch that. But Herbert doesn't do that. So it's, it's not like he can't be in their point of view when this happens. He just decides not, to. not to, it's almost like he's afraid to show the emotional parts here. And, yeah. you know, well, well, because I mean, because, you know, like you said, Andrea, this has such a great concept. And that's actually the reason I wanted to read this is because I was really fascinated by this idea that you take the Messiah hero from the first book that everybody loves and show him having flaws and becoming a bad ruler and stuff like that. So I, I was, you know, that was my main interest in the book. But I was a little disappointed in this in that I felt like Paul actually wasn't flawed really you know like because he has no choice and because he's doing his best to try to avoid the worst future as he can see i felt like that kind of made it less he, interesting than if he was actively actually evil. making choices yeah and, yeah you know you know succumbing to the yeah. temptations of when, power and, and stuff yeah like when that. you take away agency from a character it ceases to be interesting from that character's point of view you know so if, if if paul had no agency said oh you know paul he can't do anything then pick another character yeah and 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 someone with agency and and really get into their heads and and i think he sort of does this as you get towards the end but um you know like i really wanted to feel um like from the the Bene Gesserit and 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 Edric and and Skytail, I really wanted to feel like how strongly they dislike Paul and how strongly they wanted to dethrone him, not just for power's sake, but because he killed sixty one. You know, yeah. his actions and caused the death of sixty one billion people. Like there was a there was a you know uh, kind of a throwaway paragraph in there where they like decimated a planet. Yeah, you know, and and Paul's mother is like. Don't come to my planet. Yeah. Don't yeah. don't come back from Calendar. I don't <laughs> I don't want, you know, I don't want to see Paul and I, I don't want anybody here. I don't want to be a part of that. And yeah. like that's 
powerful. Like his own mother didn't want to be yeah. part of like the Hajj, you know. Um, and, but I'm, I'm understanding yeah. this correctly, right? That he never did anything bad that he didn't 100% have to do, that he had no choice. Or do we think that he did anything he, like, I think worse than he had to? The lack of action is the evil here. He yeah. does not. He does not really put anything out to stop it. I think he he has because I you know the the visions he has in the original, it's you know it's overwhelming and it's horrible. And I remember him talking about how these horrible things have come into his head, but he never. We don't see the next twelve years, but we never really see him making an effort to try. And I think that's the sin of letting everything spin out of his own control. Um, I want to get Raj. I want to get Raj back in here. Raj, what do you you think about this stuff? No, no. I mean, I mostly agree. Like, I think that the, you know, Matt, you, you pointed the specific place, which is basically like two thirds of the way through the last third of the book where suddenly things pick up and I was like, Oh, okay. Something's happening. Things are moving. Um, And I agree that, you know, there's a lot, it's very slow, the, the conspiracy kind of drops in and out. And so every time it kind of pops up and I think, oh, this is going to be kind of intrigue and, and then it drops out again. And I was reminded of the scene that we all liked in Dune, which was the the dinner table scene where there's so much menace and <laughs> yeah. so much stuff yeah. hidden in the words. And here there are so many scenes where he's doing that, where people are just talking at each other, but a lot of it is summarized. A lot of it we tell, you know, tells exactly what Either it tells us exactly what's happening with the words, in which case it loses its menace in a way, or it doesn't tell us anything at all, in which case there are certain conversations I read that I'm like, I don't know what the fuck is happening here and why um, they're doing this. So I agree that there's this kind of terrible, you know, there's not a lot going on. I think this, so the flip that I talked about before was the first time I read it, I'm pretty sure I was like, in Paul's head. And I think I was fresh out of Dune and somehow I was just like still attached to to Paul and his journey. And I, I do think that by the end, there is like, there's a few moments at the end where, and I don't necessarily want to jump ahead, but like a few moments at the end where I'm like, oh God, okay. Now I feel, I feel a little bit of what's going on in his whole thing where I think the, the facade of like, being numbed by the visions he's been having kind of breaks down and we see a few human moments, but the first time I read through, I think I was just like, oh, they fucking brought Duncan Idaho back. What bullshit. And this time, <laughs> this time I found that arc to be the only like realized and interesting arc in the whole book, you know, as a yeah. complete thing, because it's all about him figuring out who he is. And, you know, if anyone has emotion, it's sort of like his, you know, uncertainty and his you know, trying to figure out who he is. And I know that it's couch, yeah. it's hidden between all beneath all these like mentat discussions and Zen Sunni discussions, yeah. which I think obscures like what really is, you know, an interesting concept yeah. of this. Is he, no, that, is that he the man the only, is he not? Yeah. yeah. That was the only part I had a, an emotional re- reaction to in the yeah. first, yeah, like two thirds of the book was where, so, so Paul had this, you know, friend he grew up with, Duncan Idaho, who died protecting him. And so it turns out that Benny Twilax have basically cloned him. And, you know, and so so he so this we said this this character Hate, who's the clone of Duncan Idaho, comes to Paul when he's I think in the throne room or whatever. And um and Paul knows that this I mean, he can in, uh infer that this thing is somehow a designed to kill him or threaten him or something, but the emotional pull of being reunited with his beloved mentor is so powerful that he you know, can't send it away. Uh, and that I thought worked really well emotionally. That was sort of the one, like I said, the one thing that I thought worked really well emotionally. Yeah. And also like Alia keeps asking him, well, what do you feel? And it, Paul too, like, what do you feel? Is it, is it, he's like, is this the Mentat talking? Is this the Zen Sunni talking? Or is this Duncan Idaho talking? And they keep, uh, you know, pushing him deeper and getting him to probe himself, which I, which I thought was an interesting arc. But the thing that's so weird to me is that I don't understand why Paul suffers in solitude rather than expressing any of this stuff to any of his close friends. And even like, like I don't understand, it seems like the, the knowledge that Chani is going to die in childbirth, it seems like that's something that she deserves, has a right to know. Yeah. 
Yeah. But I, um, I, I think my, my interpretation was it was sort of like if he lets other people know, he'll change it. And then if he changes it, it becomes something possibly worse. Like, like I, I feel like he mentions at some point where, you know, if he tries to save Chani, it, it ends up like with all of them dead or at least, you know, the, like the, the bill, kids bill, dead or things like that. Billions more dead, I think. Yeah. Like that. And yeah. So he's kind of like, I have to kind of, I know the future. I know I need to stay on this path, even though it's going to basically gut me, you know, to my core, but it's the best possible outcome of all. And, you know, at least there is a, a somewhat happy ending as a result, you know, and that, that, and I feel like also it, it's, he doesn't, I don't think he specifies this enough, but we, you know, you, he, it, there's so much about prescience in this, which it, it gets too much. You know, he mm-hmm. and Alia have that ability, but so does the guild navigator to a certain extent. So a mm-hmm. little bit, does, you know, like a, a lot of the other people have a little bit of that. And it's, I felt like what he was going for is that it's this chess match. And if he lets it, it out, you know, too much of what's going to happen, he loses his, his power to influence it in some way. So I don't know. Well, because c- it's weird because Paul really is do, trying to do the best for everybody and the conspirators by a- moving against him are acting against their own interests. But and they don't know just, it. Right. But why can't he tell them? I mean, that's that was the thing I was sort of wondering. Yeah, I mean, I. that That's a good point. And, and, and I think that. You know, like like with hate and hate slash Duncan Idaho, where everyone keeps interrogating him, it it would have been a good decision on Herbert's part to have people keep interrogating Paul. Like, why are you doing this if you know it's going it's bad? And he's like, you know, because it's it's the you know least worst <laughs> outcome, right? Um, and yeah, like if he like that would have been extremely powerful if he had had that discussion with Chani. And it's like, look, you know. I saw this vision where you where you died and it's inevitable it's coming and if I stop it billions more people are going to die but I guess then it, it it may take the choice out of out of his hands right cuz Chani would be like I feel like Chani as a character would be like well then I should die like she's yeah. a Fre- like she's a fremen she you know the fremen send their blind into the right. desert to yeah. die you know it's that they you know they don't have you know healthcare <laughs> in the siege they're just like they're just like no I do, go in the desert yeah yeah i think chani gets a little bit short shrift in this in this novel yeah. for sure um and irialan as well in the beginning she's introduced as this huge part of the conspiracy and then like just disappears and and we're just yeah. told what happens at the end and yeah i i feel like he didn't know what to do with them but also i feel like by putting it on Paul, you're right. It takes away, like she's an, I think Chani is, is such an interesting character and there's so much to her. And it's, it was such a missed opportunity to kind of even just give us more than just her point of view is mostly just being angry at other people or wanting to talking about wanting to have her kid and whatever. And, and, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. She's a tragic I, figure too, because yeah. I don't, I never saw her as evil. I just saw like, you know, like, uh, her father wanted to marry her off. You know, the Bene Gesserit wanted to use her. And all she wanted was like a role, right? She wanted a bigger role and she ne- she never really got it. And, and I, you know, she's like a tragic figure and she really deserves more, more story, I think. Well, I thought all the female characters were oh. not well deployed. Right. No. Yeah. <laughs> novel. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll just, I'll I'll talk about Alia a little bit. I mean, you know, this is a, I mean, so she's a young, I think a young teenager at this point in the story, but but she was born with sort of the knowledge and memories of like this whole line of wise old women. And she just acts like a teenager. I mean, like it's, it's such a weird, to me, it was such a weird characterization of her that, that given what's established about, yeah, that she, she, her, her mind has this whole archive of, you know, all these different lives and wisdom and everything that it, it seems like that doesn't affect her characterization almost at all. And in a way I found really, really odd. I hated the whole, like, she has to have a mate kind of discussion. Like it was so yeah, just it was like, weird. It, it was gross. Um, yeah. <laughs> especially if it's her brother. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well that, yeah. see, no, na- that is gross, but I think that that makes sense from the Bene Gesserit point of view. And like, is that creepy sort of like, well, the bloodline kind of thing. And, and I'm glad that there's no even hint of that happening. And actually, you know, 
you, you talk there's, about Paul. there's like a hint. there's a hint okay a hint right when paul walks in yeah yeah, yeah fair enough but um <laughs> but paul you know throughout this i think one of the noble things that remains like you said david like sort of he's does he have laws does he not but like his love for chani remains strong throughout the whole thing and it's is kind of like the central point of his character through most of this and it, i just was thinking it, it's very similar to the way that duke leto you know and jessica had that relationship so that he never actually took an official wife you know his his concubine which is what chani is was like yeah. his one true love and in this paul constantly you know his life would have been a lot easier if he just you know decided to 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 knock Irulan up but like he doesn't and he refuses to and i think that at least Again, I don't think it comes across the way that it could have done, but I think that's at least a, you know a nice point there. But yeah, I mean, Alia, geez, I, I love Alia as a character. I think she's so fascinating, but she just yeah. comes off as this tempestuous youth in this uh, kind of swinging between insecurity and like angry authority at the same time. You know? Yeah, I, I was obsessed with Alia when I was, a, you know, when I first read this. Because you know, it was I was about the same age. We we're similar ages, um, but she's such a tragic character. I didn't I didn't look at it at the time as oh she's this she's not acting like a Bene Gesserit. She's just being a teenager. Because you know I was a teenager. So that's, <laughs> that's what people act like. Um, and yeah, when you pointed out like yes, yeah, she does. She is a little bit of a whiny teenager, um, but. Just, and this is just because I know what happens to her in the end. It's just she's such a horribly tragic figure in this all. And it yeah. breaks my heart. I would have liked to have seen more of the conflict between, you know, she is a teenager, but she also has this long history behind yeah. her. And I would have liked to have seen that conflict. Yeah. It's like, I just want to be a kid, but I can't, yeah. you know, and, and that would have been uh, interesting. Well, but, she does uh, have that line where yeah. she says, I just want to, you know, I just want to be loved, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought it interesting uh, on a slightly unrelated note that both books ended with a knife fight. <laughs> hmm. um, you know, you have like all these billions of people dying, but, you know, in, in the first one, Paul, uh, um, you know, has the, has the knife fight with Fade. Yeah. And then uh, in this one, he, you know, he he uses his son's eyes to, uh, to kill... Yeah. Um, sky tail and it was just um i was like oh yeah he ended it the same way interesting <laughs> all right well I, I guess let's just get into the third <laughs> act of the story so so basically yeah the first two thirds of the two thirds of the story paul's basically hanging around the palace moping <laughs> there's this conspiracy going on hate shows up etc um and then you know and there's sort of like this uh, budding romance between alia and hate and then things don't really feel like they're happening until finally Paul uh, heads out of the palace. And this is sort of, con I don't, should I even try to explain why Paul heads basically uh, Skytail, who's the shapeshifter, impersonates this Fremen girl named Lichna. And he goes to the palace and tells Paul, you need to go out to this house where there's this dwarf who has who knows all the conspirators. Uh, and this is a trap. And I think Paul knows it's a trap. Paul knows it's a trap. Yeah. But I don't um, think, I don't know that Lickna tells him or the face dancer tells him, but he knows it's a trap. Well, he, he immediately, he isn't fooled for a second yeah. by this whole shape shifting thing. So, um, and this is like another aspect in which this this whole conspiracy has a sort of Keystone Cops aspect <laughs> to it. Almost nothing that they do works yeah. at all. Um, I made a little list, but let me, maybe I'll save that for a little bit. But um, but so anyway, so Paul goes out to meet this dwarf, and there's this weapon called a stone burner yeah. that blinds him and all of his uh, guards by like melting their eyes out. Um. So I don't know. So Raj, what you think of the what you think of that all, all that stuff? Um, you know, like so. One thing I'll say is that Paul's kind of knowing that it's a trap and then going into it felt. You know, what what it evoked for me was the scene in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when Aslan, you know, gives himself over to the witch, kind of knowing mm -hmm. what's going to happen, and he's all sad and mopey and stuff. But like he knows what's going to happen afterwards. But that has the triumph of him coming back at the end. But I think there there was 
I, maybe it's like pulling from that that I felt like there was this tragic air about that whole thing. But the image that stuck with me for this you know long period of time since I read the first book that I still absolutely love is Paul getting his eyes burned out so should be blind but can see because he has seen every possible he's seen this future happen so he knows where everything is and there's something about that image and that idea and you know i think i've seen it in other places the sort of blind person who can see but i just love the hell out of that you know it just it feels yeah. right to me um and it feels powerful to me and it's so creepy when people are like you're blind and he's like yeah but i can see you know like like that and and the sort of how that feeds into the myth of, of who he is in the end. Um, so that part of it worked really well. I do think that he's sort of like, oh yeah, these are atomics and they can bore through to the hole of a planet. And also they give off radiation that burns out people's eyes. It's just sort of like this afterthought of, of there, but the, the, the image that it, it creates and the sort of that, that it, it feels, you know what it feels? It feels very almost medieval of like Paul, the wounded King, who mm. can't see but can see yeah. and has to yeah, go like off the into the King. desert yeah. yeah and that part of it that icon that i, I iconic you know I, or iconic tropic like, how do you say it like i iconograph stuff like Icon- the, iconographical i right right <laughs> I, iconography or whatever like that stuff really works for me um again i think having read this again i you know there's definitely a lot of flaws in how they get there i also think that the conspiracy is ridiculous like you said except for when what matt referred to again that when you finally get to what the what the um the what is it bene playlax those guys what they were up to it's kind of brilliant you know like that part but it comes all at the end. Like all of this stuff just gets mm-hmm. shoved in at the end. Like, oh, this is what we were doing all along. And it's like, all of you can see the future. All of you are talking to each other. Why couldn't we have seen hints of this leading up yeah. to it? You know? But even with the Bene Tylax plot, I feel like there was no way Paul was their their plot basically is to prove that <laughs> to use hate to prove that they can bring back somebody, including all their memories. And then once Paul's seen that, they'll offer to do that to Chani once she died, and he's going to be make himself their slave in order to get Chani back, basically. Yeah. And there's no <laughs> way Paul was ever in a million years going to well, go for this plan. But see, that's that's the part where I was saying, like at the end, like I do, th- like he says, no, I'm not going to do it. And then there's a point where he says, it was so hard to say that in the first place that if I have to say it again, I'm not sure I have yeah. the strength to, which is why he makes Duncan. Kill him. Yeah, Yeah. kill him. And I thought that moment, that was the most emotional moment of Paul's whole thing. It didn't, (laughs) it wasn't earned in the way that it should have been, but I feel like it could have been. And so it it still kind of hit home there. And that was the part where, because, you know, all along he's like, there's no need for violence, no need for violence. And then that comes up and he's like, fucking kill that guy. And, and like that, you know, again, I wish it was all elevated. I wish it was all set up better. But like that moment, I felt the most human from Paul. Like, and and that I loved, and the fact that like the whole time he's like, I have a child, I have a child, I have a child, and Chani at one point is like, does he not know I I'm having yeah. twins? And then he's like, holy fuck, twins! You know, like I <laughs> I like that little bit of like maybe he's not his visions aren't perfect, and maybe and they, maybe yeah. maybe there's stuff he could have done that would have gone differently, but like you know he became a slave to these visions the way that he experienced them. So, um, yeah, there's there's several places where he's he realizes his vision isn't exactly real like when he goes to the when he goes to Otham's house and there's the dwarf mm-hmm. he's like i did not see a dwarf before i did not see a dwarf this is the first time i'm seeing a dwarf um and then the the children when he doesn't all he saw was the girl he he didn't know he would have a son as well um so there's definitely well his visions are 100% well, but it's set up that his ability to see the future is clouded by other yes. people, other people's abilities. So, like, if it's the dwarf guy was part of the plot, so that's why I think he couldn't he see was him. shielded from Paul. Yeah, and then the son turns out to be like a super, yeah. super being, like, psychic person Another too. Quizette, so I think that's what, yeah, yeah. Which apparently is there's been a few of them already, or at least they created one before they keep saying it. I'm like, what is that story, and what happened to them? Whatever. So. Yeah, I want to get Matt back in here too, but I just before we get too far from the blindness thing, I did really like there's a moment a little bit after that where Paul is, I think I'm not remembering exactly, but he's like walking down the street and there's all these odd, horrified faces staring at him. And he wishes he could close his eyes, but he can't because he sees them all in his perfect yeah. pretty you know, memories or 
memories of the future or whatever. And I thought that was a really striking thing I'd never seen before, that idea that the the blind person can't not see because he has these mental powers. I thought that was really interesting. But um, but I want to get Matt back in here. So Matt, what do you, what do you think about all this? I mean, I, I, I pretty much agree with, with, what every everything's has been said so far. I mean, it, like I said earlier, that the the last third of the book is where I feel like things start to come together. Like a lot, like stuff is happening. Paul actually leaves, the, you know, the palace, and um, you know, I, I I thought about the plot. It was like this e- extremely convoluted. You know, they go through this trouble to, um, you know, the face dancer takes takes the the shape of this girl. And you know they go. They have this extremely elaborate plot um, that apparently they have no choice but to do it this specific way because that's the way the future goes. But then they dump the girl in the desert so that she can be found, like with her head cut off. And I'm like, couldn't they have disposed of the body another <laughs> way? Like, because then it's like very obvious that this is not like this girl is is an imposter. So um, I was like, that was interesting. But um, yeah, no, the the whole. Uh, blindness thing that Paul can still see, uh, had a very, um, um, like awe inspiring feel to it. It, it, it gave me the, the, the sort of, uh, same feeling I got in, in the first book, you know, when we, when we first see the worms and we, and we, we understand that they're, you know, creating the spice and then the, the spice visions, it was like, oh, there's something, uh, mystical here that's going on. That's beyond, you know, um, you know, any, any type of science, I guess. And, and so, so like, I, I always kind of like that when science fiction gets into that, uh, sort of mystical, uh, realm and in, in the sense of just like, um, you know, we, we don't, we don't really know where, where this is coming from. Like, what exactly is this? What, it, what exactly is, is the Quisax Hatterach? What exactly is the spice? What is it doing to us? Is it changing humanity in, in a way? Is it directing humanity? Um, which I think, Herbert gets into in the later books, but, it, um, so I, I, I like that part of it. Um, and, and then the whole scene where, where a uh, is basically saying to hate or Duncan that he has, you know, exactly what he's going to do. He's going to program Duncan to kill his, you know, uh, beloved, uh, mentee and, and Duncan Idaho realizes this, and and also knows he can't do anything about it like that that arc to me was was really powerful i think that was as we said one of the most powerful um emotional arcs in in the book um so yeah i mean i yeah yeah go ahead well, well how about just and just to finish up the plot while we're at it so you mentioned the the sort of knife fight thing so basically what happens at the end is uh skytail is holding a knife. So Paul's, so Chani gives birth and dies. And I'm going to skip a couple of things that happened there. <laughs> and then a short time later, Skytail is holding a knife, threatening Paul's newborn twins. And Paul, for some reason, loses his ability to see at this point, maybe because he sort of stepped off the timeline that he knows by heart. I'm not sure. I Actually, think he's no here. longer the Quisatz Hatterach. I think his son is. Yeah, I think that's. I think it's Leto. Yeah, I think. I think he passed the torch. His son was born, and then he's that. That's it. He's he did what he was supposed to do, and now it's his son can has all the visions. But his son basically gives him one last vision. He sees through his yeah. son's eyes where Skytail is, and then you you know uses the night you know throws it uses he, his son's vision to kill. He him. can't see when he comes into the room. He has to ask where Chani is and where the children is mm-hmm. are. Um, if you recall, they have to bring him to to her body, and they have to bring him to the children. So he has already lost his sight. I think as soon as probably Leto is born. I do like that they set up that knife throw. Like when when Alia is training, you know, he he turns off, he throws the knife to turn off the the training thing as she's going way too far into the danger zone. And she's mm-hmm. like, only you know, like who could have made that throw? And of course, it's Paul. And so then later on, when he makes the throw, that just happens. To, you know, he's blind and he's mm-hmm. looking through his son's eyes, and he throws the knife that goes through the eye of of the guy, yeah. which is kind of nice symmetry, I guess. Uh, you yeah. know, I I was like. Oh, at least they set up that he's capable of this kind of stuff. Because I think you would have forgotten that, you know, his training 
Um, but can I just ask a question while we're talking about Paul's abilities? So a friend of mine, we were talking about it because he, he was just reading this book too. And he's like, oh, I, I must have missed the first time that like Paul is a mentat. And I think it's set up in the first book, but I also completely always forgot. Yeah. Like, I knew he was yeah. trained in the Bene Gesserit teachings, but I, I forgot that he also had the mentat training as well. He's like, you know, he's like the Mary, you know, no, I guess it's not Mary Sue, it's the Gary Mary Sue, Sue or whatever. Like, you know, he has the best of everything. Um, but yeah. No, he totally is. Yeah. 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 Well, that was kind of my problem too. Like, like I was saying earlier is that, you know, he's still kind of, a, even as like the dictator of the galaxy, who's responsible for 60 billion deaths, he's still kind of a Mary Sue, you know, he's still like done everything perfectly and nobody understands him. And, <laughs> you know, it, it's sort of, it's just sort of one more level of kind of wish fulfillment, except in a sort of um, emo way. You know, but he's never allowed to have any actual flaws or do anything actually bad. You know, he's always sort of the perfect hero. It's just a different sort of perfect hero in this in this book. Mm. Um, but but just to, to finish up the plot, so then he um, at the end, I guess it's a fremen custom that uh, people who are blind like go off into the desert to be eaten by the sandworms, and so Paul does that, and somehow this has. Um, avoided the worst futures that he saw. Um, I don't know if anyone can explain why exactly. I, I think that uh, I'm not actually sure why. Maybe that's just the way it works. But um, yeah, I think a lot of the problem was that you know we're constantly being told, oh, you know, all these futures are horrible, horrible, but we don't. Yeah. see them yeah. we don't see them so if if we had seen a couple here's one future and here's another yeah and and you know and then at the end we say all right you know this you know we did none of those futures came to pass we'd be like oh good but you know we just have to take herbert's word for it yeah which you know is okay to a point but i i feel like you know he's doing kind of a, di a disservice to to the plot because yeah. Then we we can't imagine. I mean, yeah, yeah that that you say they're terrible, but, but I'd like to see it. You know, I think the the problem is that you know the 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 arc of the story should be something terrible is going to happen, and he's trying to avoid it, and the and the hero is making choices to avoid it, to avoid it, to avoid it, and he can't, and then this yeah. is the only choice he can make in order to avoid the worst thing. Yes. We never see him make any choices. He's already made all his choices before we even get there. Yeah. And that's why it just kind of why nothing happens, why you don't I don't feel connected to this Paul other than, yep, you're depressed. Well, I get that. Well, <laughs> the only I mean, sorry, I was gonna say the only specifics that I'm aware of is that at one point he does say that if like by letting like he had to let Chani die so that the kids or the kid in his mind could at least survive. And so my interpretation was that most of the alternate possibilities were that they all were killed and so nobody you know i don't know about paul but like chani and the kid don't don't survive and so he was from a personal standpoint that was the outcome he mm -hmm. he wanted but I, I obviously it's 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 kind of suggested that for the whole universe it has repercussions and we don't see any of that so yeah it's, it's yeah. just all, it's all subtextual and and we don't like have any direct uh, experience like Paul keeps having this direct experience, and and I and I think that part of the problem with Herbert's decision to do this sort of omniscient point of view jumping is that sometimes we don't get that interiority of the characters that um, would go a long way towards resolving some of the issues that we have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, after Chani dies, I think Paul says something like he's thinking to her in his head, but he thinks something like, "Sorry, my only choices were to let you die this way or to have you slowly tortured to death, right, right, yeah. uh, by other people for some other reason." You know, so it's like, but I, I, I wonder if, um, you know, just in, in concept, is it a mistake to jump twelve years ahead <laughs> to the point where Paul has already given up? Like, is 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 not the more interesting part? of the story, the part before he's completely given up trying yeah. to do anything or change anything. Yeah. It should be interesting. I know we're not talking about the films, but I'm interested in how um, Villeneuve um, adapts that. Because I I, yeah. I heard he's doing three films. So the, the first two films are going to be the first Dune book. And then 
the second film, I I assume is going to be this one and Children of Dune together. I don't I don't know. I, yeah, I think his, I think his plan is for the third movie to just be this to be the death of Paul, basically. So it'll be a trilogy mm-hmm. ending with Paul's death. Oh, That's my understanding. Or Paul's disappearance, at least. Yeah, and I and I yeah. and I know Villeneuve and and uh, the team he's assembled. I know that they're going to do justice to the story because I feel like for all the reasons that we spoke about, there's so much stuff that you could do. There's so much potential here. Like, like you're, like we're, we've been saying, you know, Paul has these um, visions and, and he wants to avert disaster, but can't. And I'd like to see him make a bad decision and something yeah. terrible happens. I'd like to see him say, no, no, I want to, uh, you know, this, this might save Chani's life. And he makes a decision and then a planet gets wiped out. And he didn't see that, you know, like 4 yeah. billion people die because he made, you know, cause he stepped left instead of right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it is like, holy shit. You know, like, like every little thing I do has repercussions through history but, and just see it and show it. And then that to me could be really intense. And, and if, if they do it right, um, powerful. There is one way they do that in this book that that came across to me, which is basically first book. It's set up that Dune is this, you know, it's it's desert planet, right? And and he comes up with this idea to kind of ecologically restore it, mm-hmm. sort of in the sense that it's it's not been allowed to happen, but could easily happen. But in this book, he, I think he's portrayed very clearly as a colonizer of this planet. We, there's many references to the water on the planet and whatever, and essentially how it's destroyed the Fremen culture and like kind yeah. of perverted it. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the really interesting things that he does here, you know, outside of the character arcs, you know, I, I, that we've talked about, which is there is no, like in a fantasy book, you know, the the king would make their decisions and and things would go back to like, okay. And, and in here, like there's no right move. Somebody's always going to pay a price and yeah. there's too many things working in the machinery. The cogs are moving and you can just kind of ring out possibly the best solution for yourself. But in the end, you know, like Matt, you were saying that the conspirators, you know, they have a point because of what the jihad has been doing, but they all want their own things. Like, like, yeah. you know, the, the Reverend mother wants her quits at Tatarak in her control, getting yeah. the genetic material that she's always wanted all along. You know, the the other guild wants the guild wants their monopoly that they had in the first place so that they can control everything. And so there's all these factions that are moving. Even the 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 Fremen who I, I mean I think that the subtext is there that that if Paul even had just walked away or had like told them not to do this thing, he would have been deposed and they would have still used his image and whatever, or like possibly killed and used as a martyr to continue what they were doing without he, him being able to at least steer it in, in small directions. And I think yeah. all of that functions really well and is really probably what, what um, Herbert, I mean, I don't know, I can't really say what Herbert wanted, but I feel like that is definitely something he cared about. I am super concerned though for the third Villeneuve movie now cuz having read this I never read this before if I if I didn't say that but um there's just so little that's visual in this yep. book. <laughs> yep. Uh nothing I mean, happens. If, <laughs> but they could I mean, maybe you yeah, invent you could, that, you right? That. Yeah. yeah, you could yeah. Yeah, you I think they're going to have to, yeah. They're going to have to have them. Yeah. You're yeah, going to have to see him showing like other visions. Well, the images we saw in the first movie of Paul imagining the jihad, you know, they're very short and they're, very, yeah. but like I, that gave me sort of hope that they could flesh this out. I mean, they, they obviously fleshed out like the opening of that, that book with the guild showing up and stuff. So I, 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 I trust that they could make that work. Yeah. Yeah. They could have a, you know, a scene where they steal the worm and, and they could have a scene where it's like raining in the desert and have like the Fremen be like, what the fuck, you know, that, or like, you know, uh, a battle on a, on a planet, yeah. you know, um, there, I think there's, I think there's, I think there's a lot to work with and it's going to have to be on whoever the screenwriter is. If it's, I don't know if it, Phil Neuve wrote the screenplay or whoever was writing the screenplay is going to have uh, to it's really, John Spates, I think he's going to have to really do a lot of work, <laughs> um, coming up with a story, uh, you know, a, a cinematic story because there yeah, is no was, cinematic thinking- story here. Yeah, the, this fe- the book feels more like a TV series to me. Like yeah. the, the book Dune Messiah feels more like a TV show, whereas the first Dune feels more yeah. like a cinema, like 
big bu- yeah. uh, big screen and experience. I, and I and again I know we're not talking about TV and film but I I feel like the sci-fi version of this actually did a better job of fleshing out uh some of the stories. Well, I think they they took both books. They took yeah, this they, and they Children of Boone Dune yeah, they, and put them together. Yeah. But but it's hard when yeah. you have to jump 12 years ahead. It's just like you kill all the momentum and so much happens there. All of it's in in well, all of it's in the universe and all of you know the the important driving part of this is what's going on in Paul's head and we never see any of it. So yeah, I mean, it seems like they're going to have to have have him give him some sort of confidant or something. I mean, yeah. you can't like film is just not something no. you can have somebody moping no. silently. No, you know? I mean, David Lynch just had a lot of internal mon- monologue. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> it's just like it's one giant. Sh- it's it's Shakespeare. It's fucking Hamlet for fuck's sake. It's just a prince walking around being really depressed. Well, he had. He had a ratio, at least. So he did, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. He, he was allowed. He was him. also allowed to monologue to the audience. Yes, for minutes exactly, at a time. exactly. We can't quite do that. <laughs> There's more things uh, in heaven and earth, Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Duncan could serve that. I mean, that that would make sense if he confided in Duncan, the the guy who basically trained him, and yeah. that you know, I I I kind of feel like I understand now why. Duncan had such this big role in the first film because if they plan on bringing him yeah. back for this third movie, you need to have that that feeling that like, oh yeah, this is the guy that yeah. you know. So, and it was also well, just I, cinematically good choice to have him die on camera as a, as opposed to off stage like he did in the book. But <laughs> will they give him metal eyes? Because I had a hard time uh, being like, were they just like metal it, silver orbs? Yeah, and then they I don't know about what that faceted. means. It was hard for me to picture. <laughs> I, it. So did I. I couldn't figure out what that meant. <laughs> I, I think step one in the screenwriting process will be dispensing with that whole idea. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really go anywhere. Well, you There's can't no you, you can't act if you have metal eyes. I mean, like that, or you can't <laughs> act well. It you know, like eyes. That's what I was thinking. I'm like, Alia is like attracted to him, and she keeps looking at him. But I'm like, but he has metal eyes. Like, how does that yeah. work? You know, yeah. eyes are well, like they, romance. You know, I don't yeah. know. Well, they did the blue with him, blue eyes. So maybe they do something similar where it's like gray you know, steel silver gray or irises something. or something yeah. but it never actually plays i, I don't know i don't yeah. remember from the rest of the books but it, it has no bearing on it there's like no point like it, it doesn't come into play in any way it doesn't isn't yeah. part of who he is it's just like oh he's got metal eyes okay great but yeah it doesn't but no I, I, it's also weird that i think that's a great i think that's a great idea though to make to make him essentially the viewpoint character yeah um and i feel like this book probably should have done that yeah too or because he's the only you know, one or- with an arc but uh, Mike, well, he's also like not as it's like so hard to um, identify emotionally with somebody who can see the whole future yeah. or or like Skytail has, you know, POV scenes, but he's not telling us almost any of yeah. his plot. So it's like we're, you know, there's no characters almost that we can. But even that, we, that we're that we're with emotionally moment by moment, understanding their motivations yeah. and feelings. Yeah. Even Duncan, like he's he's a he's trained as as a zen sunni philosopher and also he's a mentat at the same time um i think when i first read this i thought oh god herbert really has a hard on for duncan idaho he had to bring him <laughs> back but reading the forward it's now my my feeling that he was such a fan favorite from the first book mm-hmm. that he brought him back just kind of to please the fans um i'm not sure about what that is and so then i guess he kind of elevated him but i i did i did actually like him this this time so well, I haven't read any of the other books, but what people were saying online, I think, was that Duncan kind of becomes the main, you know, Paul sort of yeah. Yeah. goes, you know, steps off stage and, and Duncan kind of comes to the fore. So, I mean, it kind of makes sense, um, you know, that, that he needed some some other characters besides Paul to yeah. carry the story forward. Yeah. Well, well I, I don't remember where we come in in Children of Doom, but I think Leto and the Ganema or whatever her name are, are, are teenagers when we first start, right? Like 15 or 16? Something like Sounds that? Sounds right. I, I know not. I don't it's, remember. Been, it's been years. Yeah, it's been years. But I, I do remember right, Duncan being in that book in the beginning, so that, that makes sense. He is, yeah. yeah. Duncan and, never and goes Alia. away. And Alia, yeah. They get married. Wow. Sorry, did I just ruin everything? Oh, oh, no. spoil, oh, no. Ah, spoil. You're going to have to delete mean, that, dude. <laughs> no, I, I mean... I mean the, that's not. I guess I could have seen that one coming. Uh, um, 
All right, let's let me just look over my notes if there's anything. Can I just big. say, like, there were still little touches of the world building that weren't quite, you know, on the level of the first novel, but there were little things that I was just like, I like the face dancer thing because it makes sense. He sets up this whole like nerve control thing and all this training, and so yeah. I kind of like that idea. I really love. I don't know why, but like, you know, I know the the planet X has been mentioned before, and. Just a little explanation that like, oh, it's basically comes because it was the ninth planet, <laughs> ninth planet. in the solar system right. and <laughs> Ix is the Roman numerals for nine. <laughs> and that little kind of like, that just made so much sense to me and felt so real that that's how it would happen. Yeah. Of course, then later on you get like, well, that's Ixi and architecture and that was created by Ixi and engineers and whatever. And I think he gets a little too caught up in the whole Ixian <laughs> thing, but, but I did like that. It's just like, I don't know. Sometimes you hit upon these things that that would really possibly happen, and that's how it became the name. And I love it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. That was a nice little touch. And is that where like the the whole like like even the Lynchian version of the 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 navigator and the tank came from? Because it's not described that way in the first. Book yeah, book, I was. Where... Oh, you're correct. Yes, that's the first time I, I remember reading that. I'm like, wait, this was not in the first book, huh? And they describe him a lot as fishy. Yeah. But again, Ed, uh, Edric comes into it. He's kind of menacing. Then he seems clueless and then he's gone and then he's killed off screen. It's like, you know, that part yeah. is also Shakespearean too. I feel like, you know, someone yeah. came on stage and said, oh, we executed we all them. these people. Didn't they say in the first book that the navigator swims in like a gas, like a, 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 I don't uh, remember. a spice gas? Do yeah. I, 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 I don't remember anything like because I had only read the first book. And so then when I saw the Lynch movie, I was like, wait, was there a description of them being like octopus monsters? I don't remember this at all. So my impression, maybe I missed it, but my impression was that there was nothing about that in the first book. Yeah. And I think that that's a bit more of an extrapolation of of what the intention was, at least in this book. But, you know, like to your guys point, you've said it already, but like all the executions happening off screen, like I would have loved to see them murder the reverend mother like yeah. i really would have you know that would right. have yeah. called it around or like i was just expecting when when paul met with her that it would be a reverse of the the first scene they had together where she makes him put yes. his hand in the yeah. box that <laughs> that <laughs> should have yeah. been the flip yeah. side of that one that'd be good um yes. but it, yeah. it it didn't happen and i was like oh man because like let's get he... let's get denis villeneuve and <laughs> In a writing in the writer's room, let's suggest this. <laughs> yeah, and and you know she she talks about her revulsion for Alia, but like I wanted those two in a room because like in the yeah. like I love the scene in the Lynch movie where she screams at her as it calls her an abomination, and she does that in the book. But like I wanted to feel that like tension, and I wanted Alia to rub it in her face, sort of like the way she does in the movie, and that that also didn't happen. Yeah, I'll also just just mention uh, you know that. This is a, the second book in the Dune series that includes literally zero jokes. And uh, <laughs> uh, I really feel like this series could use a Han Solo type character. Well, you know, somebody who. The dwarf has riddles and be, things. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I, I will say, say, you brought this up, Matt. You liked his character. But that like, are funny. I mean, wait, wait. They're, they're, they're I, I think they're out? like mocking funny. I know I didn't laugh out loud at them, but. Um, he. It, they're There's clever. not a lot that's. It's. I keep saying Shakespeare. I keep going back to Shakespeare. That character, the Bajaz character, is a very Shakespearean character. Yeah. Very yeah. Shakespearean. But also, oh, totally, yeah. Sinister dwarf, not a good, you know, not a good stereotype to 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 perpetrate. I think you know, like it, mm-hmm. it would have been nice if, like, I feel even Skytail was given like humanizing. You know, like at some point you're like, oh yeah, that's a pretty valid thought. And you, you know, he, he's right to question some of these things and he doesn't seem like a complete evil bastard, but Bajaz just seems to have like one purpose, uh, you know, all along, but yeah, he is very Shakespearean. That's a good call, Andrea. But, but uh, yeah, I, I feel like maybe in, in the film, you know, like they added a little bit of humor in the, uh, Denis Villeneuve movie at the beginning, which I thought was a nice touch but maybe you know i i feel like in the in the third one maybe they could have uh stillgar or duncan, duncan. Ida- idaho yeah. or somebody have a little you know just a little humor because <laughs> well especially yeah not... the tone in this one being so heavy and emo and like you know tragic in a way like yeah you're right like it it would be more powerful if there was some levity and duncan seems at least in the movies he's he's pretty lighthearted at most of the time so yeah. When it, does he make that joke about like Paul's arms and then 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. not yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. I, that, so there. Um. All right. Cool. So I feel like. Uh, is there any other big topics anyone wanted to, to oh, bring up? Oh, you know what? I, we... I do. The whole. Th- I had to look this up. The Dune Tarot. This thing that oh, came up. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, this is. Com- this was completely a new thing, but he doesn't really explain it. So I actually Googled it. Um, and apparently it's something that came up as a faddish thing. I, I'm sorry, in in the world of Dune, it became a faddish thing on Dune and then went off planet because people were wanted to be want to prophesy their own lives. And apparently every time somebody uses their oracular powers, it changes the future. And that's oh. sort of like what was muddying the waters for Paul and Alia. I did get um, that point, but I, the tarot wasn't explained. Yeah, it was never explained, but that's why I, I went and looked it up. But I was just like, how do you take a whole new thing like this and throw it in and never explain it? It was <laughs> just very like... Someone it, had to have made a real version of that, right? I'm yeah, sure oh, of course. Like, oh, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's out there. Believe, I just Googled it like you know, yeah, yeah. About half an hour ago, but, an hour ago. Um but, but, but no, I, I think the I didn't get this on my first read, but people were talking about it online. And then I had, I went back and looked and I had underlines one line that I didn't understand at the time. But I think the idea is that the conspirators were intentionally yeah. Yeah, that's what make, I got to. popularizing this Dune exactly. Tarot to increase the number of uh, oracular uh, yes. people around to minimize yeah. or to try to limit Paul's powers as much as possible. Exactly. But it doesn't really hit like yeah. it never really yeah no, well that's sure. that's there's so many things in this book that i think like could have been explored and would have been more exciting yes. than yeah. the endless you know internal musings on certain things and you know they're just kind of thrown in or they're you know they're not set up properly and, a, and i yeah. think that's that's unfortunate that's one of the most unfortunate things about it yeah, yeah. it's just yeah. it feels like a very overall like as a book it just feels like it's very unformed mm-hmm. it just it felt like a all, these are the ideas, and I put these ideas down, and here's a first draft. Now let's go yeah. back and fix it, and then yeah. no, never it, went back. It to feels fix very it. first drafty. That's yeah. true. I don't know. Did I he wonder, have an editor? Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, did he have first readers that reviewed it and other know. other than I, you know? I think I said this on the 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 first book podcast, but I'll say it again that years ago I was at a at a con at a I said I was about to say convention, but I meant to say con, <laughs> meaning a convention, where I was at a coffee clutch with um, George R. R. Martin. This was when the, you know, Ice and Fire books had been coming out, but before the TV show had had come out. Um, but he was talking about Frank Herbert and how Herbert did Dune and then wanted to go off and do other things, and publishers kept pushing him back and saying, "Give us another Dune hmm. book," and like his other stuff wouldn't sell, and so. You know my impression, and and I don't. I think this is probably somewhat accurate. Is that, you know, he wasn't like dying to go back to the Dune world, but kind of like, you know, in order to keep his career going and and make a buck and and sort of sell a book, like he was forced in that direction. And so, my guess would be that his heart wasn't as in it as the first book. Um, obviously, like you said, David, he, he probably had some of the material, but. Um, it it feels a little less well, less. I mean, because I I there's a book called Dreamer of Dune, which is a biography of Frank yeah. Herbert, written by his son Brian Herbert. I read it so long ago, I don't remember much from it. But I I think that he worked on the first book for a long long mm. time. Yeah. So it could be a thing like with a band, you know, mm. where you have your first album is like your best material from ten years, and then it's a big hit, and then <laughs> you have to put out another album next year, you know, <laughs> yeah. and you have sort of the sophomore slump. I mean, I also I don't know. This is pure speculation on my part, but it did make me wonder reading this book how much of his mixed feelings about being a sudden celebrity with all mm. these people wanting him to be their guru and oh, stuff yeah. found its way into this novel. David, do you know off the top of your head the the, the amount of time that passed between when, or when Dune came out and then D- Dune Messiah? I think it's just like a year. Or oh, two. really? Um, okay, it was pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. So maybe he just rushed this one out just to kind of get a paycheck and and kind of keep his uh four income. years oh four, four years. years okay four years yeah 1965 uh, was dune in 1969 it was in galaxy mm-hmm. okay wow. all right so not not super fast especially this is not a very long book no so. not yeah at all. 
Um, but actually, according to online commentary, this is the weakest book. I mean, a lot of people feel like this is the weakest yeah. of the six that Herbert wrote. So I don't know. I mean, we'll see if we... How does how does everyone feel about reading Children of Dune? Everyone, I mean, I now I that? now want to do yeah, it. Yeah, I kind of feel like yeah. I have Same. to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I still love the Dune universe. You know, like with all my criticism of this book, like I I still think the universe that Herbert created is amazing. Yeah, and I I want to I want to read more more of it. So um, I'm I'm all in for the next book. Yeah. Yeah. My fear is the the one thing that that I think drove me away, um, which comes up in this book, so I don't think it's a spoiler, but like I think he gets a little too into like the genes thing for me, where you know, genes carry the power and genes carry whatever. And I always I always question that very strongly yeah. in when it shows up in fiction. But I'm I'm definitely willing to to give it a shot. And is this the sort of me kind of relating to the Duncan Idaho character so strongly compared to the first time I read it makes me wonder like how I will be on the, on the next one. I, I believe I remember Alia being in it and I, again, yeah. I, I find her fascinating and I, I want a better story for her. So maybe that's, yeah. that's where it comes. Right. So, mm. well, yeah, well, she we'll doesn't get a, she doesn't get I don't a mean story. better. I just mean a more, <laughs> a more deserving yes. story, you know, in some ways. Uh, yeah. yeah. More active role is yeah. I think what you're saying. Oh, I do have one question that you guys can answer for me. So at the end, when he's giving the summary of like, oh, these guys were killed, and like it seemed like Irulan completely just flipped yeah. her thing. Like, like people are like, oh, she's pretending, and they're like, no, sincerely. And yeah, I just that just felt so off to me that he just like threw that in there, like sub- yeah. like there was no that was not earned at all. She no. was not really a fully formed character ever, and no. and. Yeah, it just seemed like a convenient way to be like, well, you know, she's going to survive and and teach the kids. I don't know. I didn't like it. Yeah. It it, it just didn't end well. That's just <laughs> it, <laughs> it just did not end well. <laughs> and I don't mean for the characters, uh, I mean for the readers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um all right, but so let me explain so the the plan is going to be we've read Dune Messiah and then next up we'll be doing Children of Dune and then we can go and watch the Sci-Fi Channel yes. miniseries Children of Dune. Yeah. Let's do it. Uh, and by that time Dune Part 2 the movie will be out again or be out rather probably so. Yeah. Yeah. I it's bet. never yeah, I ending it's, I mean, Dune. I think it's scheduled still for 2023 so Yeah, I think it's I the end of the anyway. year, right? So definitely we got at least uh what's that at least three more Dune panels to go and hopefully he'll do i think like the second dune didn't even have one has to do well in order i don't think they they haven't greenlit the third one yet Jesus. i think it's just something he wants to do so they are really uh, when I, bets my god when i die my tombstone's gonna say he talked a lot about dune yeah uh, yeah seriously <laughs> <laughs> actually just kidding i'm not gonna have I think, stone, so. <laughs> I think i've talked more about you're just dune. gonna walk out into the desert yeah. That's actually not a bad way to go, actually. Um, I, I feel like I've talked more about Dune as an adult than I did when I was a teenager and completely obsessed with it. I because I had nobody to talk to. Like I was the only geek. Right, I, I was going to say now you have a chance to talk. And now about I have a chance it. to yeah. talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. See, all that all that reading paid off. <laughs> reading Dune every thirty like, five year years later. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> totally worth it. <laughs> It's like this book, you know, really slow in the beginning and then at the yeah. end it just <laughs> right. And then everybody dies in the end. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. So why don't we get in some final thoughts? So, uh, Matt, final thoughts on Dune Messiah. Um, like I said, uh, I love the Dune universe. Um, I, I thought that uh, parts of this, uh, some, some of the ideas are really cool in it. Uh, had a little problem with the execution, the first two thirds. It's kind of slow, but then it picks up in the last third. I have some problems with the ending, but um, yeah, I'm excited to continue and, and reading the next book. Uh, Raj, final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think we've talked a lot about the, the the flaws in it as a novel, but I think there's a lot in here that I still absolutely love. I think Andrea nailed it by saying it feels like a first draft, and I wish there could have been a better second draft You know, where all of this stuff was more accentuated and, and, and done better, but I still, Mm. I still love it. I can't, I can't really, I can, I can criticize it all I want, but I, I, I kind of love this book still, no matter what. (laughs) Uh, and Andrea, final thoughts. Uh, just if 
funny how I'm walking away from it with pretty much the same feeling I had as I did 14 years ago, which was, I am really depressed now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also with the, wow, this isn't a very good book feeling as, the, you know, as somebody, you know, as an adult who's, who's a writer looking back and going, looking at it now as an adult and going, wow, that's, that's not well written. And, and it's actually an interesting it's always good to see something not well written because you can when you can see the flaws, it kind of like it's a good teaching experience. Not that I really yeah. wanted this teaching experience, but it is actually a really good teaching experience of wow, okay, don't do that. That doesn't work. Um but yeah, I, I uh I'm I'm rather rather depressed now. And uh I need <laughs> to go I need to go uh mourn Chani um now. <laughs> well that's that's a good note sense. And I mean, yeah, I mean I, I really you know, was not crazy about this book. Although it's interesting looking online. I mean, you know, you look on Amazon.com or whatever, and it's like four and a half stars. Just like the first one is four and a half stars. You know, it's <laughs> like, and I saw like some people, you know, who are big Dune fans say this is their favorite really? in the series. Wow. Yeah. Oh my god. I think I, I'm I'm sort of baffled by that. I, I I think though that um you know for some like I care more about what I would call sort of the storytelling. Like, you know, the characterization and the mm -hmm. dialogue and the action and stuff like that. And I think if you're really more interested in the, in, in, in ideas and themes, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. I think there's sort of a contingent that feels that this book has What's, rich enough ideas and themes that it kind of, it's, you know, that's the thing that they really I guess, um, yeah. focus on. It is definitely chock full of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And thoughts. And thoughts. Lots of thoughts. <laughs> Lots of thoughts. And philosophy. <laughs> and philosophy. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, not necessarily a ringing uh, recommendation for me, <laughs> but I am definitely kind of curious now to read Children of Dune. And uh, I also feel like this is probably a book that's better to reread, you know, to go back and reread because it's just so like confusing or, you know, <laughs> uh, so much is elided um, the first yes. time through. Whereas I think if you go back and you, you kind of can put more of the pieces together and, and, and maybe it's a little bit more of a satisfying reading experience when, when you're not just trying to figure out, you're not trying to like connect the dots so much um, the way that you are on the first time, at least for me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, definitely looking forward to Children of Dune. So keep an eye out for that. And I think we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Andrea Kale, Matthew Kressel, and Rajan Khanna. So thanks, everyone, so much for joining us. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Andrea Kale, Matthew Kressel, and Rajan Khanna for joining us on the show. This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy was made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And remember to check out the new graphic novel, My Life Among Humans, by longtime Geek's Guide to the Galaxy listener, Jed McGowan. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.